everybody to the, to the base uh, first civil rights committee. And to start off, we'd like to ask uh, Vic if he introduced the pledge. Sure. Hey, everybody. Yes. I pledge in the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which is the one nation and one God, and it is for liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Very excited. Sandra. Well, this is pretty stupid. Hey, keep it down. I was trying to. Okay. Uh, again, I want to welcome everybody and also those who are on Zoom. And just let everybody know at the present time, Facebook Live, we're, I haven't started because we have a lot of, as you recall last month, we had a lot of audio problems. And so I'm going to not to set that up until we find out one, get the audio fixed so we can just be able to hear it or not. We don't want to hear them. And those who are on Zoom, if you would please go ahead and mute your screen and also take your, your video off. Uh, just a few things as a reminder, we still do have our, our membership cards here. So if anybody who's here, I would like to sign up for membership. And before we get first time, we got any first timers here? Okay, we just talked to you welcome from the fucking board. And I'll get, like I said, I'm going to get your name put on, the, on, our, on our email list. Also, if you look in the back, we do have some, some flyers that we got from the Cumberland Valley, which is, it covers Carlisle, Shippingsburg, and the West Shore. These are good little pamphlets for like a little quick half-day drive. But a lot of people don't realize how much civil war happened around this area during that time period. And just a quick two quick notes. Uh, me and Steve are working on two future trips, uh, field trips. We're right now looking to talk with Scott to nail down the bus. For November 4th, November 4th, with Scott made us to a second Winchester. And we're finalizing with the quiet uh, Steve McCowski. How about Chris McCowski going to do a spot to Vandy Courthouse November the 4th? That's the case. May 4th. Fine with that. I got the date right. May 4th. May 4th. Oh, I almost got the right. <laughs> Great track. But May, I'm sorry, May 4th is going to be uh, with a uh, second to Winchester. So, uh, Without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. All right. Well, I would like to introduce our speaker for the night. Uh, he lives in upstate New York, so it took him over two and a half hours to drive down here. Uh, Bengola uh, is a lifelong student of the Civil War. He has written articles uh, for different uh, magazines and so forth. He does field trips. Uh, and he, he graduated with a degree in business and economics. Uh, again, he lives in, uh, up in the upstate uh, Orange County, New York, with his family. Uh, he's married with, and has two sons. And also, uh, the city where he comes from is also known for the famous 124th New York Orange Blossom Regiment. So let uh, us here, her Chiefs of War Roundtable, give Vic a nice warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. And those on Zoom, uh, if you have questions, we'll be more than happy to to take them and uh, we get through the program. For the next 45 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about a Civil War battle that has two names, like so many of them do. But the significance of this battle, uh, I think you will be greatly impressed upon a few factors you didn't know. Like if I just took a poll and asked you, what do you know about the Battle of Seven Pines or Fair Oaks? Somebody's gonna say, Johnston got shot and Lee got promoted into the Army of Northern Virginia. And that's all I know about the battle. Because you know what? That's all that pretty much people do know about it. There's not any books written about this book uh, battle realistically until uh, yours truly came along and started doing some deeper research on it. Uh, and we're going to talk about it. Okay, I'll cover it for you. Have questions, be more than glad to take them. So we're going to talk about Seven Pines and Fair Oaks. My focus is on contrast to command, uh, command comparing the Confederacy compared to the Union leadership, which was 
uh, really quite remarkable here. The Confederates blew it big time, May 31st, 1862. A battle, had they had won this battle, they would have destroyed 40% of the Army of the Potomac on the outskirts of Richmond, Virginia. On to Richmond, would have been away from Richmond, and McClellan would have been in big trouble. So instead of thinking about running for president, he would have been thinking of saving his you-know-what. Uh, so he would have lost 40% of his army, a lot of material, and think of what it would have done up north. The newspapers would have been all over Lincoln and Stanton. The Peace Democrats would have been suing for more peace. Who knows if Europe would have said, hey, listen, these Southerners are for real. Maybe we should think about recognizing it. All of that didn't happen. Why? Because the Confederates blew a chance to win this battle. And the man that was probably responsible for, for making sure the Confederates did not win is Edwin Bowes Bull Sumner. Uh, he had his best day ever as far as command of the Second Corps here. And it was probably the only time in the Civil War that he really led to the effectiveness that he would be uh, known for later on. Let's see if I get this right. Hit the, uh, the bottom. Uh, at the bottom? I'm sitting on the right. The right person. It doesn't like me anymore. Hang on. We're, we're going to go with there we go. So, Battle of Seven Pines or Fair Oaks, which is it? Well, if you talk to Joseph Johnston, who led the Confederate forces here, he said this Battle of Seven Pines or Fair Oaks, as Northern people prefer to call it, with no action of the Civil War, has been so little understood as that of Seven Pines. Well, ladies and gentlemen, one of the two primary culprits why this battle is so little understood is Joseph E. Johnston. He played a big role in making sure a lot of information was suppressed about the outcome of his dad. Bull Sumner was testifying before the Joint Committee for the Conduct of the Civil War. When a panelist asked him, General, the Battle of Fair Oaks or Seven Pines, they are the same thing under those two names, as I understand. Sumner Brisson, he said, oh no, sir, they are two distinct places. The Battle of which I commanded on Saturday and Sunday was at Fair Oaks. The Battle of Seven Pines was a separate battle General Heinzelman commanded there. Uh, hang with me, but I'm going to explain this to you. Seven Pines and Fair Oaks were sectors of the same battle. There's a Seven Pines sector and there's a Fair Oaks sector. Here's where the battlefield occurred. There's the Confederate capital of Richmond. There's the Chickahominy River, which plays a major role here. Here's Seven Pines. Another key uh, part to recall here is here's the Williamsburg Road and the Nine Mile Road. Those two roads intersect at Seven Pines. So as I show you more on the maps, that's where the primary focus is going to be. Now, McClellan began with the Army of Potomac in early April, advancing through the peninsula onto Richmond, first stops at Yorktown, and then the battle uh, May 5th in Williamsburg. Johnston, after the Battle of Williamsburg, decides that it's time to fall back, and he pulls his army to the western or southern bank of the Chickahominy River, which, by the way, is an ugly river. And we'll talk about that in more in a bit. No schools of art, no schools of music. The Chickahominy, slow moving, narrow, but has a wide floodplain, approximately 400 yards in width, if swamps. Uh, that, that border, that river. Johnston crosses the river on May the 18th. May 20th, McClellan sends forth here at Bottoms Bridge, the fourth corps under Erasmus Keys. Two days later, the third corps under Samuel Heinzelman joined him, and Keyes moves his men out to Seven Ponds. So by May the 30th, this is what the map looks like. I'm going to break it down for you. Uh, McClellan had five corps. The fifth corps, Fitz John Porter, positioned up near Mechanicsville. And his position there is actually where the Battle of Beaver Dam Creek will happen in, uh, later in June. William Franklin's sixth corps is positioned outside of Newbridge, which is a major crossing of the river. Let's come down to Keys, his fourth corps position. McClellan really messed up when he sent Keyes' fourth corps out first. The Fourth Corps was the least trained, poorly led, 
and their munitions and their equipment, the same regiment would have four different types of rifles within the same regiment. It was a disaster. And yet he sent the, the most greenest of the green, the most untrained of untrained to be the tip of the spear. And they are out here at seven times. There's two division commanders, Silas Casey, He's out here on the Williamsburg Road and Couch. We're supporting him and on right flank uh, near the Nine Mile Road. There was a gap of over two miles between the Fourth Corps and the Third Corps of CNL 19. Sumner, his corps is moved to a position called the Tyler Plantation on May 25th. Sumner was given three jobs by McClellan. One would be to protect the supply lines, which are actually off this map on the York and Plumonkey River. The second role would be if Porter and Franklin are attacked, he's to protect their flank. Third role would be if Keyes is attacked, he's supposed to support Keyes. And in order to do that, because these bridges weren't built yet, he would have to move his men down to here at the Williamsburg Road and out and across to where Keyes' position is. The distance of well over 10 miles. If there's fighting going on, it's going to take you a long time to move an entire floor 10 miles. Sumner decides on his own, he wants to have bridges built. He summons two colonels, uh, one from the 81st Pennsylvania and another from the 5th New Hampshire by the name of Edward Frost. And he tells him, gentlemen, you're going to build the bridges, one for Sedgwick and one for Richards. So this is the famous photo you've seen probably of the Great Vine Bridge. And I'm going to tell you, this is not the bridge that Sumner actually crosses, because this bridge photo was taken Je uh, June the 5th. I don't think it was, it was still around by then. But at any rate, when you call it a bridge, are you familiar with what a causeway is, right? A causeway leading to a bridge. The Chickahominy River, like I said, narrow, sluggish, flows very slowly, lots of undergrowth, lots of snakes. The causeway uh, and bridge combination here was 1,200 feet long. Causeway was 1,100 of those 1,200 feet. Okay, so what you're seeing here is part of a causeway that was built across the swamp. So they started where they thought the bank would be at high uh, flood time and go across to where they thought the other bank would be. Cross his men of the 5th New Hampshire built this bridge. And as it says here, not a pin, dowel, nail entered into its construction. The men have accounts where they tied it together using grapevines, hence the name Grapevine Bridge. The Confederates, let's pick out what their uh, defense looked like. Uh, most accounts will tell you that Johnston had an army of 53,000 men, the Army of Northern Virginia, and he did. However, Robert E. Lee, who was then their service assistant to Jefferson Davis, had marshaled together reinforcements because they knew McClellan was coming. The Confederacy, by that time of this battle, in and around the city of Richmond, had over 90,000 men. McClellan had 102,000, 90,000 in and around Richmond. What you see pictured on this map is well over 70,000 of those 90,000. So, how do we get to the fighting of May 31st? I knew you were going to ask. That. So here's how we get to it. Johnston actually had a plan where Gustavus Smith, his second in command, was going to, on May 29th, 8 o'clock in the morning, he was going to attack Fitzjohn Porter's position at Beaver Dam Creek. But instead, on May 28th, Smith did a reconnoiter of that position and said it's basically unassailable, it's going to be costly, why do it? And he talked Johnson out of making the attack during a council of war uh, on the evening of May 28th. Longstreet was present for his council of war. He was infuriated by that result. He spoke to Johnson afterwards and told him that if I'm in charge of making that attack, it would have been successful and we would have won the day. Johnston said, it appears as though I picked the wrong general to lead this advance. May 29th comes and goes. There's no attack. May 30th, Daniel Harvey Hill does a reconnoiter along the Williamsburg Road and sends message back to, to Johnston saying, Keys is vulnerable. Their position is ripe for the taking. 
Johnston calls Longstreet, not Longstreet and Smith, Longstreet to his office and says, we're going to make a plan to attack Keyes and then Heinzelman's exposed to court. And here's the plan that they come up with. This is the plan. There's a couple of variations, but I'm going to give you the plan that they've finally set it on. Longstreet will move his sixth brigade, 13,800 men, east along the nine mile road to that position called Old Tavern, placing him squarely on the right flank of Keyes' fourth corps. Benjamin Yugi will take 6,200 men and move them down to Charles City Road by 6.30 in the morning to relieve Robert Rhodes' brigade. Rhodes will then join Daniel Harvey Hill's division, placing his division at 12,500 men. Once Rhodes arrives, the attack will begin. He will advance straight at uh, Keyes' position uh, with 12,500. Once the found fighting starts, Longstreet will come down on the right flank with 13,800, over 26,000 men assaulting a corps of about 12,500 men. After they destroy them, they'll go on and take on Heinzelman. That's the plan. <laughs> Sounds simple enough, and it's pretty logical. However, things get in the way. First thing that gets in the way is that Johnston is meeting with Longstreet. And Longstreet's taking notes. Johnston does not see the sense of him issuing a plan of direction or orders to Longstreet. He's been there while this entire plan has been developed. So he doesn't issue him any written guidance of what his expectation is. Huge mistake. Second thing that happens, five o'clock or so, when your meeting breaks up, a rainstorm hits the area. And it's not just any rainstorm. It's a rainstorm that was described as being a biblical proportion. Okay, it was like a flood fell from the sky. We've all seen those kinds of rainstorms. But for the next six hours, it was a downpour of incredible amount of rain. And since it had rained four of the seven previous days prior to that, everything was flooded. So the Chickahominy went directly into flood stage. All these streams and tributaries were banked full and overflowing. The roads were a mess, the fields were a mess. But nonetheless, around midnight, it all stopped. And the orders that had been given to Yugi to move his men, his men were moving to get to this position for roads. But something's going to happen. I call it the traffic jam at Gillies Creek, a misunderstanding, according to Johnston and Longstreet. Gillies Creek is right here. For some reason, Longstreet didn't move his six brigades east along the, old, the Nine Mile Road. He moved south towards the Williamsburg Road. And he got there at six o'clock in the morning or thereabouts. Hugie's division arrived within a half an hour of Longstreet arriving. Longstreet insisted that since his division was there first, they had priority to cross, which makes no sense because he was involved in the plan. He knows Judy has to get here for Rhodes to get here so the attack can start. But for some reason, Longstreet's insistence causes Judy four hours of delay. Worse, Longstreet hasn't told the boss what's going on. Johnston has no idea where Longstreet is, has no idea of his status, his condition, or what's going on. He's sending out riders to try to find him he doesn't know what Longstreet is. Longstreet's not communicating. By 10 o'clock in the morning, Johnston is so exasperated, he says to a staff officer with him, he says, do you hear any sounds of fighting, which are supposed to start at 8 o'clock by the way? And when the officer told him, no, sir, I do not, he, he says, I wish the troops were back in their camps. It doesn't sound like an assertive leader looking to, to guide for success. Sounds like someone that's accepting defeat. However, Daniel Harvey Hill is not of that same category. Hill, when he receives word at 1030 that Judy's men have crossed Gillies Creek, he sends a rider down the roads and says, don't wait for Judy. You get up here, and when you do, we're going to start the attack. And that's precisely what happens. By about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, he first commits his Three brigades, soon followed by the fourth, and he strikes Casey right as planned along the Williamsburg Road, right directly in the front. 
This is the beginning of the fighting in the Seven Pine Sector. And the fighting is actually going very well for him, despite the conditions. He's driving Casey's men back, but Casey's men are putting up enough of a resistance that Hill notices there's a gap between the right flank and the railroad, but he doesn't have enough men to exploit it. He sends back word to Longstreet, send me a brigade, Longstreet does. When the brigade arrives at Robert Anderson's brigade, he splits it into two. Anderson and his half of the brigade will go along the Williamsburg Road. Micah Jenkins is going to meet with Hill here on the Williamsburg Road, and Hill's going to tell him, I want you to go up, find the right flank between there and the railroad, and go across and drive down seven times. It'll unhinge the Yankees in their country. And that's precisely what Micah Jenkins and his 1,300 South Carolinians do. He goes up, cuts across. Darius Couch has moved two regiments up, 61st Pennsylvania, 23rd Pennsylvania, uh, Bernie Zouaz have moved out here. They get chewed up pretty badly by Jenkins' assault. Jenkins cuts across the Nine Mile Road, gets into the rear, and goes down towards the Williamsburg Road, unhinging the Yankees in front as he held desire. But think about it. Jenkins, with 1,300 men, is doing precisely what Longstreet should have been doing with 13,800 men coming in on that flank. He wasn't there. Blown opportunity. So uh, it's a great story about Jenkins and how he swallows them up and defeats them. But this is the condition now, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. As you can see, the Confederates are having great success in the Seven Pine sector. They're driving the Yankees back. Carney's division has come up in support, but there's mayhem here on the federal side. The right flank is being held by Darius Couch, some of the stragglers from the 61st Pennsylvania, and an approximate 2,000 men of a small brigade with four artillery pieces here at the Fair Oaks Station. Couch, when he gets there, realizes he's on an island. He can hear the sounds of fighting to his left and rear. He knows that he's on the right flank of this force, and he knows he's terribly exposed, and that there must be a large force that will soon be coming down this road, hitting him squarely in front, and he doesn't have enough men or opportunity to resist them. So he calls. I'm going to use Paul, right? Yeah. Paul's going to be my captain, William Van Ness, okay, staff officer. He's going to call Van Ness over, and he's going to say, Van Ness, you ride for your wife to those bridges and find out if Sumner has crossed, and if he has, you tell him to come here like him. So off goes Van Ness, and we'll come back to that in a minute. So couch is in a problem here. Let's go to Sumner. One o'clock in the afternoon when the fighting starts. Sumner is having lunch with Sedgwick and Israel Richardson at his headquarters at the Tyler House. And when the sounds of fighting grew louder and louder and louder, staff officer provided the following account. He said the sounds of the fighting went straight from Sumner's ears directly into his heart, and he began directing orders to Cedric and Richardson to form the brigades now and form them at the bridgeheads and await his orders to cross. That was before McClellan had even sent word to, to uh, uh, Sumner, Sumner that he needed to mobilize. He mobilized at least an hour, saving an hour worth of time in doing that. It's imperative to understand how crucial that was on his own volition. Second thing happens, 2.30 in the afternoon, McClellan does send an order across the bridges. Now, most of you are familiar with the first Minnesota in our great charge at the second day of Gettysburg. Well, the first Minnesota, is the lead regiment here for Willis Gorman's brigade, and they're the first ones lined up at the Great Line Bridge to cross. So imagine you're some 22-year-old corporal or private standing on the edge of that bridge causeway, and you look out and you see something that you're supposed to cross going like this, mm -hmm. and with logs floating into it, and water all over the place, and you don't swim. 1,200 feet, folks. But as the men started walking across the bridge, they went through mud just to reach the causeway. Once they got to the bridge itself and started crossing, the weight of the men crossing the causeway in a bridge, because the grapevines had given the flexibility, actually caused the bridge lifted 
because of the flooding, as the men went across it, had actually settled it down onto the piers that they had constructed. They were able to get all the way across, got to the mud on the other side, and when they got to the mud on the other side, they, they turned it all up with the horse crossing and with the men crossing. It was a mess. Then comes a six-gun battery under uh, Lieutenant Edward uh, Ned Kirby. Kirby's guns go across 10-foot wide, 1,200-foot long bridge that's bobbing and weaving. They get to the other side, and all the horses sink into the mud. So they have to unhatch all the horses, unhitch all the horses, attach prolonged ropes to the trails of the guns. And while men are lined up in line to pull on the, the ropes, other men stacked their arms, got in the mud and the muck, and were turning wheels and lifting the barrels of the guns up, sliding them through to get them to the other side. An incredible story of determination. These guys were going to go help out their band of brothers not far away. That's when Van Ness and some of me, and Van Ness delivers the word that he's needed by Cal. Now, while all this is going on, all this is occurring, Keyes would write, my right was on ground. Think of it. Look at his right. Look at how he's spoken to you. My right was on ground so favorable to the approach of the enemy and so far from the Chickahong that if Johnston had attacked them, um, I could have made but a feeble defense comparatively, and every man of us would have been killed, captured, or driven into the swamp before any assistance could have reached us. This was a crucial moment. And what's Johnston doing? He is at his relocated headquarters up at the old tavern. He's brought forth a division under command of William H. C. Whiting. Whiting is a temporary commander of this division. Why? Because Gustavus Smith gave him command of the division six o'clock in the morning. So here's Whiting around 3, 34 o'clock in command of an 11,200 man division. The commander of the army is right there next to him. The commander of the division is 10 feet away and somehow or other, he's supposed to be in charge of the division. Anybody here wanna be in his position? I think not, Ron. But in any rate, 11,200 men. This is where Johnston is. Now, the same sounds of fighting that came from here this way to Sumner did not go from here three miles northwest to reach Johnston. He couldn't hear the fighting. There is what's known as an acoustic shadow. But even with an acoustic shadow, Johnston did nothing to explore the possibilities down the nine mile road. Who wrote the attack plan? Johnston. What was supposed to happen down a nine mile road? A flank attack. Who had 11,200 men and didn't move? Johnson. He moves when he receives a note from Longstreet, the other brilliant scientist in the show, who sends him a note saying, oh, if you show up here on my left flank, we can drive the enemy into the river before nightfall. That's all Johnston has to hear. He tells Whitey, assemble the division, but it's gonna take us too long to move. It's getting closer to four o'clock. It's going to take us too long to move the men and the guns. We'll move the men first, then we'll move the guns. So he's advancing with no artillery. Another huge mistake, as you shall see. So as they start to move, you see these four dots up there where it says Nine Mile Road. That's where two companies of 61st Pennsylvania that were on picket duty are situated. Any uh, hockey fans in here remember the name Bob York? Yes. Okay. Okay, this is not that Bob York. <laughs> this is Captain Robert Orr, who will earn a Medal of Honor April 2nd at Petersburg, 1865. This Robert Orr sees this large division coming down the road and realizes he must go and tell Couch and, and Brigadier General John Abercrombie they're about to have company. <laughs> at the same time, there I go getting excited again. My throat isn't anybody catch it, please. Couch and Abercrombie at the same time are having a decision to make. They know they can't stay here and fight because the position is too exposed. But up here where it says Adams, there's a slight ridge, and they've decided they can move to that slight ridge. And if they move there, where did I put the? Oh, there's. If they, if they move to that slight ridge, they will have 
and affect its position. So when Orr shows up with word, so Couch and Abercrombie, they decide they're going to move that small brigade to that slight eminence. And here's what that slight eminence looks like. And what eminence? This is 34th New York. They mislabeled it as the Williamsburg Road. It is not. It is the present day Hanover Road. In my book, I call it the Great Pine Bridge Road because it didn't have it. But where they are here is here. Half mile away, right here and right here is where Fair Oaks Depot was. With four guns at this position, no division is going to cross that intersection. And Couch knows it. And he knows that it's going to be a strong position. But he also knows with a division heading his way, he's in deep doo doo to try to do that. He needs help. So now, you people are going to have to work with me. Three things are happening simultaneously. Being Italian, I can only explain them one at a time. Okay? So here's the three things that are happening. Johnston and Whiting's division is coming down the nine mile road. Sumner, with Gorman's brigade, actually, is crossing the river and they're running at the double quick to get to the Adams uh, location. Couch has moved his men up this grapevine bridge road to that slight eminence. All three of these things are happening at the same time. I'm going to start with Johnston's side. When Johnston moves, Longstreet's note said, we need you to support my left flank. But did Longstreet tell him where his left flank was? No. So he didn't know where he was going. So he detaches 1,900 men of John Bell Hood's uh, Texas Brigade and sends them off to search for Longstreet. He's as uh, six North Carolina is led by a fellow whose name you might be familiar with, William Dorsey Pender, who at this time is a colonel. In a few hours, he's going to be a brigadier general promoted by uh, Jefferson Davis on the field. Pender is leading the six North Carolina as skirmishers for Evander Law's brigade. Johnston and Whiting are riding behind Law's brigade. Behind them is J. Johnston Pettigrew. Behind them is Gustavus Smith, who has with him Wade Hampton and Robert Hatton's brigade. So they're still in line. As they're moving down the road, Whiting gets the sense he sees this activity through the fields in the area, and he realizes that there's a force moving to his left and slightly to his rear. He gets nervous. He's been in charge of a division for all six hours. Wouldn't you be nervous too with the boss sitting right there? So he tells a rider to go forward and tell uh, Pender to stop. Or the Ford, the rider makes it to Pender. Alfonso Avery of the 6th North Carolina also observes this activity going on in that slight evidence. He calls out to Pender, Colonel, there's Yankee flags on our left. And with that, Pender gives the order by the right flank, charge bayonets, and the fighting is about to begin. Now let's go up here to Couch. Couch, after he arrives, has his four guns deployed, begins to deploy that small brigade he has, but he knows his right flank is exposed. And who comes riding back? But my good friend, Paul, who also known as William Van Ness, and he comes back with the word, Sumner has crossed and he will soon be here. And within a few minutes, Couch sees Sumner riding across the field with Gorman, and he sees those men from the first Minnesota slogging through the mud at the double quick to get there. And it's in his official report. I'm not making this up. Couch then said, I knew then that God was with us and victory would soon be ours. And he was right. So they begin deploying while this is happening. So the Fair Oaks sector fighting is now beginning. Pender deploys the 6th North Carolina. Law sees Pender deploy. He has orders of he deploy, he deploy. So they both deploy and they begin marching across the field to attempt to take the uh, position uh, that, that they were in the Yankee flags. And this is what it looks like coming up that road from a Confederate perspective. Law's guys would be on the left hand side of the road. I wish I could give you a better picture, but there's approximately 800 houses to the left hand of that side of that road today. 
on the right hand side of the road, only about 100 houses, is where uh, Pender's men were coming. But up in the middle of here is where, to the left, is where Abercrombie put his brigade. There's artillery guns in the road, and there's artillery guns as Kirby's guns arrive that stretch out to the other side of that blue house. And when the Confederates first make the attack, <laughs> Private Feimster of the Second Mississippi wrote, "The Yankees opened immediately and with a destructive fire on us from their batteries, and we had no artillery with which to engage them." Remember, Johnston left his guns behind; they were already outgunned. Shortly after that, Pender would write, "The fire of the battery was so unexpected and so severe, we had to turn back." So they they pull back, and this is. Um, Ned Kirby on top and Andrew Fagan commanding a section of guns there as well. So this is where we're going to go to next. But before I get to the second advance, there's going to be three advances, get to the second one. Remember the flooding that occurred. Remember that biblical rain that fell from the sky. Everything was flooded, including what I call my book, The Nameless Stream. It wasn't until I was able to identify the nameless stream that I was able to identify how the attack went. All the good previous accounts of this had all kinds of variations of what the attack looked like. This one is researched, and I guarantee you, yeah, I, I invite you to try to prove me wrong. But at any rate, this nameless stream stretches down into the battlefield, and it confines, confines the Confederate attack into a 350-yard front between where the nameless stream ends and where this road is. It's 350 yard, three, three brigades, 6,500 men compressed into that narrow funnel. And how do I know it was that way? Because a lot of accounts talk about a swamp, but it wasn't until I found John Bell's account that said our column moved across a lagoon and he's with Hampton. And if he's with Hampton and they moved across a lagoon, the rest of his account talked about they couldn't move further to their left. So that tells me that they were forced into this narrow funnel. And this is what the name of the stream looks like today. Well, it falls into a culvert that runs into a cul-de-sac where a lot of houses are. And this is what the map, the historic map looks like. And you can see it comes right down into the battlefield. So with that, the Confederates are compressed in that 350 yard front, advancing across the muddy field into like thickets, and uh, some trees that are that are going low, and it's just a difficult maneuver. Here's what Sumner does when he arrives. Ask Couch, what do you need? Couch says, my right flank needs to be protected. First Minnesota under Colonel Alfred Sully. Sully, take him to the right. When Sully gets to the right, he sees that lagoon, and he realizes he can't be fired. So he takes three of his companies and faces in front, takes seven of his companies and swings them down, as you can see here, so that they have enfilade fire coming down the line of attack. Sumner also moved a section of guns from this position to this part, so now he would have artillery fire coming from both ends of his line. Abercrombie's men, approximately 1,400 men here, are on that straight line across. As the 34th New York and 82nd New York arrived, he swung them down so that they would have also laid fire into that narrow, very narrow uh, funnel of attack the Confederates had. What Sumner had done, taking advantage of the terrain, was he had built himself an inverted salient. All of his fire, all of his artillery fire is concentrated into the center. All the Confederates can do is move into that funnel and take it. Here's a couple of accounts from the Confederates. Uh, this guy who wrote this, his name is Christopher Columbus Cole. He's going to kill the EMT, but this, this is an account that you just can't resist using. He says, the captain, the, the enemy were in rifle pits, and the fire appeared to come up out of the ground in one continuous stream. Or rifle pits, they stacked up logs and, and fence posts, but it looked like rifle pits to the Confederates coming in. The fire was not in successive cracks, and neither would the usual term used by historians, the roll of musketry apply. Oh no, the sound was one continuous roar for well over an hour. 
I could not make my commands heard to the rest of my company. That's how loud it was. Another from Hampton's Legion wrote, the Yankees presented a living wall of flame from the great number and rapidity of their discharges. And Private B.F. Moody from the 35th Georgia in Pettigrew's Brigade wrote an account June the 2nd to his wife. So it's very fresh. He wrote to her, I have hived bees, but they were not nearly as thick as the balls that were flying through the air. So that's his description at that time. It is during this attack, Pettigrew was wounded, struck in the shoulder. The ball comes out near his uh, windpipe. He believes he's mortally wounded and he's going to die. And he tells his men, leave me here on the field. He is later captured and he's taken to the Adams house where he's going to spend two nights in that house convalescing. Uh, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So while this is all occurring, Gustavus Smith, whose actual division this is, he can see they're getting mauled. And he can see that there's no leadership coming from the front, from either Johnston or White. He decides now he's going to take command. And what he's going to do is he's going to move Patton's Reserve Brigade and a 22nd North Carolina forward and make a third advance. He meets with Hampton on the edge of the woods, and they decide now we're going to push directly towards those guns. So we're going to try to break the anvil right where the guns are. And they launch a full out, a full scale attack. Now it is starting to get darker. It's well after six o'clock. John Bell, the fellow that wrote about the lagoon, said the condition of the air was such that the blaze of smoke and the battle settled low over the field, and I could only see the blaze of guns and the flashes of lights. Another wrote, the, the light of the evening was lurid from the blaze of the hostile guns and the multitude of the messengers of death were thicker than raindrops in a tropical storm. Theodore Barker of Hampton's Brigade is adjutant, said <coughs> of the artillery fire, the most murderous fire of great canister and musketry opened upon us. I cannot pretend to describe it. It was awful. Shot and shell moped through our ranks. Now, while all this is going on, seated on a horse in front of the Adams, at the captain of the first Minnesota band, Edward Neal is his name. Neal is there with Sedgwick. He's there with, with I'm sorry, not Sedgwick, Sumner, Couch, and others. The leadership ride in front of the, the house, watching the fight. And he's most impressed by the artillerists as he sees them manning their guns. And he wrote in the middle of June, the rapidity and the loading of firing of the guns sounded like the incessant pounding of some great steam boiler shot. And it excited the attention of an admiration of General Sumner and all those present. Those guns in two and a half hours of firing fired close to 600 rounds of shell and canister, 10 guns against none for the Confederates. So it is at this time as well, the 20th Massachusetts and the 7th Michigan are arriving as well as other reinforcements. 20th Massachusetts, there's a young man, 21 years old, a lieutenant, first time in battle. And as he's coming into this, he's seeing this panorama and he wrote to his brother. He said that the noise was terrific. The whole scene was dark with smoke and lit by streams of fire from our battery and all the guns firing at the rebels into the, into the woods. Quite a scene for them. So on the Confederate side, some heavy loss, line officer losses. Not only is Pettigrew down and out of the action, but as you can see, Champion Davis is killed during this attack. Uh, Gustavus Bull is mortally wounded. He's taken to the Adams house where he will die. His body is placed in one of those mass graves that they had afterwards. His remains are never covered. Uh, recovered. His personal effects were sent back uh, by Colonel Lee of the 20th Massachusetts to General Lee, uh, who we all know, and they were sent to the Bull family. Robert Hatton was riding alongside Gustavus Smith in command of the Tennessee Brigade. And while he was moving his men forward through the woods, an artillery shell struck his horse in his chest, killing a horse. The horse falls on top of Hatton. Hatton extricates himself. Smith asks, are you okay, General? And with that, as he responds, he's shot in the chest and he's killed immediately. John Riker is the only line officer lost on the federal side. 
Riker, if you're familiar with New York City, Riker's Island prison. There's his family known on that island. Riker is smoking a cigar. All Union casualties, uh, line officers, are smoking a cigar, waving their sword overhead. That's the story is that he was doing as well when he is shot and killed. Uh, when the Confederates are making a rush towards the uh, Union guns. Um, it is at this rush as it subsides that Sumner realized it's now time to go from the defensive to the offensive. And he tells Gorman to order a counterattack and a full line counterattack surges forward, driving the Confederates from the field. Uh, Lieutenant Ropes wrote, Sumner gave the order for the whole line to advance together. And we did so at the double quick, charging with a bayonet and making a tremendous cheer. It was a great sight, dark with smoke and lit up with fire of guns from the line of bayonets stretched as far as the eye could see. Another young man, uh, Henry Lyon, who's also going to die at Antietam, wrote, advancing forward with a bayonet is a sight that one will not be apt to forget in one's lifetime. We charged them in mud that in places was halfway deep and feeling total disregard the danger of a feeling revenge towards the foe that converts a man into a demon. So after the counterattack is successful, Lieutenant Henry Abbott, 20th Massachusetts, who was present at Paul's Bluff disaster, wrote to his uh, father, you have no idea what a glorious feeling of victory brings. We were almost drunk with joy and so hoarse from cheering, we could hardly speak. While all this is going on, Ghost of Johnston is observing the fighting from down here near the uh, Nine Mile Road. An artillery shell explodes, he gets caught with some shrapnel, and he's also struck with gunfire. He's down and he's pretty severely wounded. He won't return until November of 1862. Lee comes to him, Davis comes to him, detained to him temporarily before he's sent to Richmond for care. And it was shortly thereafter, the next day, as a matter of fact, that Joe uh, Davis uh, anoints or pr promotes Lee into command of the Army of Northern Virginia. And for most people, that's all they know about this battle. But I think you know now, now there was a lot more that went on before. Yeah. So the battle pretty much ends that evening for that day's fight. As you can see, Sumner has secured the right flank of the Union Army by moving forward when he did, and he stopped the advance of close to 11,000 man division. The Butcher's Bill 459 on the federal side. And tell me about this position. First Minnesota, they wouldn't see killed and wounded like that on July 2nd, would they? Look at those numbers. It's astounding. It tells you how good their position was, where it was. On the Confederate end, they actually only had 9,300 men actually involved in the attack, and they had well over 1,369 casualties uh, in this fight. So remember, I'm talking to you about contrasts and command. George Mindel was a captain at the time, Medal of Honor recipient at the May 5th in Williamsburg, wrote, if Johnston's plan had been fully executed as the time and place as contemplated, the left wing of McClellan's army would have sustained irreparable disaster and a retreat the whole army would have followed. Think of Lincoln, think of Washington, D.C. They were already in the throes of angst because Jackson is in the valley at Winchester raising all kinds of tumult over there. If Jackson raising heck in the valley, a, a huge loss on the outskirts of Richmond, just politically, it would have been devastating to the Northern cause. It would have been great for the Confederate cause. Huge lost opportunity. Billy Ray, the 23rd Pennsylvania wrote, the brave summer was too much of a soldier to uh, go beyond his orders to merely assemble his command. He moved beyond his orders to mass his troops at the bridges and then press on. And so he had arrived just in the nick of time, as you saw, as the rebels began their assault. So the evening comes. Israel Richardson's division finally arrives. They're able to get across the bridges. Their bridge washed out. When the Miller broke, the 81st Pennsylvania washed out. They all have to cross the Great Line Bridge. Well, three of the four brigades across the Grapevine Bridge. This is what his position looks like at nightfall by the following morning. There's 36 artillery pieces 
in this field, defying anyone to come down the nine mile road and try it again, or to try to take this position. But nonetheless, the Confederates have massive force here, and it's not very clear as to which side opened the fighting, but the night, next morning at seven o'clock, there's two Confederate brigadiers, one named Armistead and another named Pickett attacking the second corps in its center. Does that ever happen again? Okay. <laughs> but Armistead's guys get waxed this time because they're advancing kind of like on an oblique angle and the way they're advancing, they're taking all of this fire. So most of them won it's their first time in, in the battle. Uh, our state stays with about 250 men. Billy Mahone moves his brigade forward, and the two of them, Pickett and Mahone, and Armistead's remnants form a pretty good, there's roads in there, farm roads. They form a pretty good defensive perimeter there, and it's pretty costly back and forth fighting. So much so, Oliver Otis Howard, when he had two arms, before 5 o'clock p.m. on June the 1st, this is what he would look like, okay? He moves his brigade down into the center and across. He's struck in the right elbow, which causes the amputation of his arm, which is going to happen 5 o'clock p.m. on June the 1st in the Adams House. This pretty much ended the fighting. The June 1st fight was really a wasted fight. It was a fight that really wasn't called for. The Confederates weren't going to do much, and no, they didn't. And uh, Sumner's position was just far too uh, strong for them to even attack. This is the Adams house. The barns in the back are not uh, period barns. The house is the porch on the front is a modern addition. It's a screen that wasn't there at the time. But somewhere in front of that house is where Chaplain Edward Neal was watching the artillerists that would have been standing here if you could turn around and look, they would have seen Neil, and this is what Neil was, would have seen the backs of the artillerists would have been firing in this direction. This is where some of the Kirby's guns would have been located. Second floor bedrooms upstairs, one of those two bedrooms is where Pettigrew spent the night. The first floor parlor is where Howard's arm was amputated. Um, there is a modern addition onto the Adams house that was built like in the mid 1900s. And that tractor trailer was not there at the time. But that tree that you see there, it's a witness tree. There were six trees uh, at the time of the battle. Tarps were strung amongst the trees to protect the men. It rained like crazy for the next few days. Uh, and the, the tarps were set up. Men were underneath those tarps receiving care, as well as being in the outbuildings, as well as those that could be received care in the house. Henry Ropes, when he talks about coming in and seeing that flame and fighting going off over here, he's walking down this field this way. He's coming this way. The 82nd New York, 34th New York are, dead, are on this flank facing the back wall of this building. So here's where our total casualties are. As you can see, the uh, casualties by sector. Seven Pine sector, much more bloody. Okay, and sector along the Williamsburg Road. Most of the casualties are there. That's Hills guys fighting Erasmus Keys, uh, Silas Corps, um, Silas Casey's division, as well as Carney's division. That's where the bulk of those casualties occur uh, for those. <coughs> The Fair Oaks sector actually is much less in comparison. However, think about the impact of the right flank being preserved on the Union side. Uh, who knows what would happen had it been anything different? You're looking at 11,168 casualties. And I probably run over time, right? No? Okay. I still got six minutes and 22 seconds. No, I'll use that for questions. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you understand that this battle, there's a lot more to talk about as far as it goes. There's a lot more to be said. Uh, the contrast and command here are stemmed. The Confederates, their first golden opportunity, which nobody talks about, was here. And why don't they talk about it more? Because there was a total suppression other than D.H. Hill in his division, there was a total suppression of reports, especially on the uh, Fair Oaks side of the battlefield. 
There was no reports that came out of it. There was Pender wrote a report, Gustavus Smith wrote a report, but none of the other regiments wrote a report. Johnston's report, well, I pick it apart in my book. Um, Longstreet's report, he was supposed to command uh, both days. His report of June 1st is a total of six lines. His report of the first day's fighting this begins with, how's this for a defensive comment? As verbally instructed by the commander of the army. In other words, I'm not to blame for what occurred here, uh, but I make a strong case for why I believe he was to blame here. Sumner, on the other hand, outstanding day. He doesn't take command. Couch doesn't take command. The right flank is gone. Who knows what's going to happen to this corps and the third corps? However, it would have been a devastating impact had the Army of the Potomac lost those two corps May 31, 1862. And with that, you've probably heard enough from me. So now I'll take questions with you. Questions? Vic, uh, I, I have read about the, uh, the horseback exchange of command between uh, Jefferson Davis and Lee. Why was not Longstreet considered before Lee? Because he actually had more combat experience than Lee from the Mexican War up. What was the, the relationship between President Davis and Longstreet? Um, excellent question. Let me phrase it in full. Because Lee was actually um, third in command when 1861, five generals were given the full rank of general. First was Samuel Cooper, second, Albert Sidney Johnston, third, Robert E. Lee, fourth, Joseph Johnston, fifth, P.T. Beauregard. So by ranking position alone, that's why he would have selected um, Lee. Plus, Davis and Lee went back to That's old right. army days, okay. politically in a lot of other ways. Um, that ranking that I just gave you caused a lot of disharmony between Johnston and Davis because Johnston believed he should have been number one. Uh, so there's, there's a lot. It's loaded. Longstreet was a rising star. He had done very well at uh, um, first Manassas. Uh, he had done very well at the Battle of, of Williamsburg. So he had he'd been a, a chosen child, so to speak. Johnston loved Longstreet. Um, and he covered for him. It was actually the, the misunderstanding, quote unquote, was actually Johnston covering for Longstreet, which Longstreet never explained what he misunderstood. Good program. I appreciate your research. I mean, that was very original. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He went out. Thank you for coming. Oh, but Tom's going to stand up on the trouble. Okay. Hello, here, sir. First of all, we think that this is about that. And then you heard our little token calling that we have made us show you. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed the program. Uh, let's give Mr. Ringoli a, another nice thank you for his Obviously, this was a two day battle, right? Yeah, well, in total, it was 12 hours of fight. In total, it was 12 hours of fight. 12 hours, two days, 12 hours. Shiloh was two days. 12 hours. Shiloh had 23,000 casualties. This battle, no, Shiloh had more hours than, than this. I'm sorry. Shiloh had two full days fight, uh, 23,000 casualties six weeks prior to this. So just imagine the American homesteads, right? You get six weeks, 23,000 casualties. Now, this is the first big one since first Manassas. 11,000 on the doorstep of uh, Richmond, Virginia. You know, now a lot of people realize this war is going to be around for a while. It's, it's going to be a big... One more thing. Uh, after uh, Johnstone was wounded, 
Was it a long street that took over the next day? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started on long street, but you did. <laughs> long street. <laughs> long street. Ah, where do we go with this? Uh, long street, what he did on May 31. In my book, I have an appendix chapter called Understanding the Misunderstanding. It's all about the myth that they created. Every book you Anything you read that somebody's written about Seven Pines, they'll say there was a misunderstanding, right? You see your head going up and down? Yes. Everybody says, Stephen Sears says it, Jeffrey Ward says it, everybody says there's a misunderstanding. The misunderstanding is Longstreet didn't want to do his orders, just like he didn't want to do his orders on July 2nd. Lee was here. He was physically present. He knew what the orders were. He saw what Longstreet did, not only on May 31, but on June 1, which I'll get to in a minute, when he saw what happened here, to my opinion, okay, based on my research, my opinion, and I know there's gonna be Gettysburg folks that'll attack me for saying this, but my opinion, Lee was here and saw Longstreet's act, May 31, June 1, 1862. When it comes July of 1863, he said, let me grab that leash just a little bit tighter because I saw what you can do with a loose leash to Johnston and to Smith. What he does to Smith, to me, he should have brought, been brought on charges, but he wasn't for various reasons. Smith orders him to come to his headquarters because Smith is now in charge of the army. You're up at Old Tavern. That, that's what Smith is. Smith can't find Longstreet until about one o'clock in the morning. Now you figured Longstreet's been in charge of this battle all day. When he gets to Smith's headquarters, it took him one time to get there. They have a conversation, and Smith hears for the first time that it was Hill's division that did all the fighting, not Longstreet. Longstreet had two of his six brigades committed to fighting May 31. It was Hill's men that did all the fighting, yet all the notes that Smith had received was how heavily engaged Longstreet was. So he, now Smith is upset because he's lost his division. They got pummeled on Fair Oaks. So they developed a plan, which Longstreet disagreed with. And the plan was run by Lee. Lee, let Smith know, I approve of your plan of what would be for June the 2nd, June the 1st. Longstreet rides to Daniel Harvey Hill with the understanding he's in charge of the army on the Williamsburg Road. And what he does is he goes to Hill and says, here's your orders. See you later. And he left. He left Hill in charge of the army again, and that's why the fighting happened the second day. So there's a whole, if you're a Longstreet lover, you're not going to like the things I had to say about Longstreet. <laughs> okay, because he really did, did some dirty stuff here. My opinion is Lee knew what he did. Lee being the gentleman he is in many ways, just knew he, he knew how to command men. He knew how to lead on a field. I don't want to lose him because we don't have too many of them. Jackson's dead. So I'm going to let's my go, but I'm going to keep a short leash. You're in. We went down to that area on a field trip about five or six years ago. I was tickled by your comments. What an ugly river to took a in. Mm -hmm. What a have made them think that they could be successful in that kind of terrain? I, I guess they thought it was easier than the more direct route from Washington south. But um, in the larger context of the seven days, all right, the Union had a good day on this one, right. Johnson getting wounded and all that. But the whole seven days campaign was a disaster for the right. Union. So what did they really accomplish? Well, apart from getting Lee promoted, who <laughs> turned out to be the most aggressive general in history, well, the only uncounted uh, innumerable casualties for the Union. Well, when Johnston moved his army across the Chickahominy, him and Davis, when they were still talking, had a conversation. Well, maybe you'll get lucky enough in McClellan to finish enough to follow you across because then he'll expose his army on both sides. So they were hoping he would do that. And the reason McClellan did it was because the James River allows for ocean going ships to go as far up as we know, almost to, to the capital city of Richmond. So he was going to shift. 
his uh, supply base from New York, the Monkey River, at White House Landing, all the way around. He was in the process of doing that. In order to do that, he needed to have that position on the southern or western bank of the Chickahominy River, but he chose the Fourth Corps. I mean, you know, the Fourth Corps, many of the regiments, this was May, many of the regiments had been formed in March. These guys hadn't even been trained yet. And the officers were being weeded out, the incompetent officers. So that was the wrong corps to put at the tip of the spear. Uh, so there was a lot of things that early war, early fog of war. Go ahead. You want to take a moment and mention your book? Oh, that's coming out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, my book is a long story. Thanks to the COVID, it went from being published last. April of 2022 for the 160th anniversary of the battle to November of 2023. <laughs> so that's uh, one thing that happened. Uh, so it got pushed back. The title of the book, uh, we're still hammering out between Savas Beatty and myself right now. Like I wanna have something to do with uh, with the uh, band uh, as far as the contrast and command, I think it's important. Savas wants to have something more on Seven Pines. And I want to be honest with people, as you can tell from my talk, my talk is more about Fair Oaks sector and less about Seven Pines. So I don't want people buying a book thinking they're getting Seven Pines and Fair Oaks. You're getting some Seven Pines only that gets you to, after Jenkins, I'm off of Seven Pines. I don't know about what happens the rest of it. I didn't research it. Okay, I, I, I was once sitting in the queue too, and I had the same experience with Mr. Savas. Yeah, what, which he's in the middle of moving right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a little round talk. No, oh, okay. So yeah, you know, you know the drill. So you, I think you mentioned it. Jefferson was there. Davis was there. He observed everything, right? Yeah, he was there. So no heads were rolling here, Davis. Um, did he make changes? Well, I was made changes changes from Lee. Right. That's it. Yeah, uh, he promoted Dorsey Pender. Um, Gustav Smith got very ill June the 2nd. And that's one reason why there's no reports. Um, Smith says, you know, he should have insisted. Whiting, this is a telling comment I forgot to mention. Whiting refused to write a report. He told Smith, I'm not writing a report. Figure it out. Where was Whiting the entire time? Who was he with? Joseph Johnston. So if he's refusing to write a report, he's refusing to tell on his good buddy, because they were good buddies, Joe Johnston and his encounter. Case closed. And then when the rest, when Smith was immobilized for so long, others just never got around to writing reports. What I was able to cobble together about what happened on the Confederate side came from letters, uh, from reading the letters that went to the Richmond Examiner, the Carlston Courier, the Richmond Dispatch, and other Confederate newspapers, the letters that the soldiers sent, as well as some of the letters that the officers had sent, I was able to say, huh. so I got all these threads, and that's putting all those threads together is what led me to understand this understanding of what happened. Could it be different? Yeah, I guess because there's no reports. I'd love to get Armistead's report. I'd love to get other reports. But pretty much from what I was able to get from all the ones that participated there came from letters from the soldiers. And most of you were soldiers at one time. Thank you. You understand that the soldiers knew a lot, especially when they wrote a letter June the 3rd, June the 4th, June the 5th. It's all fresh as far as what happened. OK, thank you. Uh, just more close, just a reminder. Tomorrow night, the Harrisburg Silver Rock Navy is going to have a meeting. And we do have suppliers back there. It's going to be uh, Dr. Robert Sandell, right? And it's Copperheads and Draft Resistance in Pennsylvania during the Civil War. So that sounds pretty interesting. Next month, we're going to have uh, Dr. Um, God Godfrey, who's Harrisburg last week. We talked about the uh, lookout point in Prisoner War game in Maryland. So thank you all for coming, and we'll see you all next month, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.